Hey, Dr. Christensen here. I want to talk about what's been called the second agricultural revolution. The first one was when we domesticated animals and domesticated plants. And that allowed us to really have control over our ability to extract nourishment from the environment and convert that into offspring and do it more effectively. Now we're at a point to where the difficulty is extracting nourishment without doing so in a way that creates large amounts of pollution, large amounts of suffering for non-human animals, large amounts of fossil fuel requirements, deforestation, antibiotic usage. So humans consume meat. We consume animal protein. There have been a percentage that have not since time immemorial. That percentage probably will never become all of humanity without some viable alternatives. So there's a thing called cellular agriculture or clean meat. And within five to perhaps seven years, it might replace the meat that we have today. And this is, this is not plant-derived artificial mock meat done better. It's actual meat. It's actual animal protein. But the way we've done it up till now is that we've either hunted animals or we've raised domesticated animals to use their muscles. And that's really been the bulk of it. And the inefficiency is just vast. I've heard arguments talking about scales of you know, 40 to 100 to 1 in terms of the amount of caloric fuel input per unit of caloric fuel output. You know, how much food do we have to give to animals to get a certain amount of food back? And, and again, we probably won't have the whole world become vegan in the short term. But with the growing rate of mo the modernizing world and many of the mid-level countries coming up to speed, we've got to figure out ways to feed the planet more effectively. So what is clean meat? Well, it's meat, so it's not anything that's, that's different from the meat we eat now, but there's no animals involved. So yeah, the term has been cellular agriculture. So rather than farming animals, you're farming cells. And this is actually already happening in some ways that no one has been bothered by. Case in point has been insulin for diabetics. Prior to the 1980s, insulin was not made from synthetic forms, and it was not made into purified extracts economically. There was a point in which it was derived from cadavers. They had to take cadaver pancreatic tissue and basically squeeze or extract insulin from that. It was horribly inefficient, and insulin was ridiculously cost prohibitive. And there was concerns with just purity and contaminants and how reproducible it was from batch to batch. But the technology formed by which bacteria could synthesize and basically spit out insulin all day long. And with that, the cost of pure, natural human insulin plummeted, and those who needed it were able to better access it. Not only that, they could make varietals of it that were more quickly metabolized, more slowly metabolized, based upon how it was constructed. So the same idea is now being brought to bear on our food. So you have a hamburger, for example. The hamburger really just represents muscle tissue from the cow. You know, it doesn't require an entire animal with hooves and a brain and a nervous system and all the rest of the parts. It's just the actual protein. So the technology is now to where they can take a cell, uh, an actual cell from a cow, done by biopsy. So one cow gets one shot one time. And that shot is given with a hollow needle that some cells come inside of. And so some muscle cells are taken. Those cells are then grown. So it's pretty exciting. They would take those cells and put them into a vat and have them along templates that would hold them in place and then give the nutrients the cells would need to, to grow, and also give some impulses they would need to divide and, and start to become more plentiful. And also, they activate them via currents to make them active, so they're actually moving, so to speak. And again, there's no animals involved. This is only the cells. But the end product is a piece of meat that is indistinguishable from a piece of meat had it been taken from that same cow. There's no difference. At a microscopic level, there's no difference. Now, some versions of this are easier to do than others. So ground meat, for example, doesn't require the complicated texture of a steak. 
you know, a steak actually has microvasculature. It has some collagen fibers that run through it. There's also more amount of fatty acid marbling in it. And that's not prohibitive, but it's a little more complex. But ground meat, that's done right now. That's pretty doable. The same technology is also used for things like skin grafts or creating artificial organs. You may have seen things about human ears that have been grown in cultures or in dishes. And that's complex stuff, but it's made in fashions by which cost is, the size and the cost are not as big of considerations. You could spend a lot for a small part and have it be justified. So the same ideas now are being retooled to scale to where you could take large amounts of stuff that's more simply made and have it be economically effective. So what are the advantages? Well, there's the humanitarian advantage. You know, uh, if, if, if I could be a healthy vegan, I would be a vegan. And I've known many who have felt the same way. And I think that in, in a lot of cases, we lead our morals by practicalities rather than vice versa. You know, case in point would be whaling. There was a time up until the 1800s to where the whaling industry was largely driven upon the supply of whale oil. And that was really the best oil they could find for lighting the lights that were used in the big cities. There were people who were making humanitarian arguments against the practices. And it were, they were valid arguments. You know, these animals were being hunted close to extinction. And by any estimate, whatever we have going on in our brains, whales have the same structure. There's even things called von Kahneman cells that we think are related to the activity of consciousness. Well, whales have those too, you know, so there, there's no clear difference between them and us. And many were making points like this. But it wasn't until kerosene became a new thing and patented and cheaply produced that the whaling industry plummeted. And it wasn't because of the humanitarian arguments, as strong as those were, it was just because of economics. Now kerosene was cheaper, it was easier to make, it was cleaner to manufacture. Why would you spend more for whale oil when kerosene would work better? So that's one big difference. As this scales, it can be much more economically advantageous also. And people joke right now because they've made things like a burger or some meatballs that cost on the order of a few hundred thousand to produce, and people laugh about that. Well, you know, the first iPhone cost over a billion dollars to produce, and that means nothing about how much it costs to buy one now after they've been made in mass quantities. And the same thing applies here. So yeah, the first iteration, there's a whole lot of startup expense that goes into that. But once it's scaled, these costs can plummet. And they already have been plummeting just dramatically. Another big benefit would be nutritional. So with, with animal protein, there's, there's ways you can modify their nutrient content, really based upon the feed or the activity level of the animal. But those are your constraints. You can't move it past certain levels. But in this context, there's really not big limits. You could have ideal fatty acid profiles. You know, we hear about grass-fed meat being higher in omega-3 fats. It is, but not by much. It's kind of like being the tallest building in Bismarck, North Dakota. <laughs> so rather than about 2% omega-3 fat for a commercial meat, grass-fed meat might be 3 or 4%. But it's not on the range of 30 to 40 percent like fish is. So it's not significant that way. But you could grow clean meat and you could have 30 percent EPA if you wished. You could change the micronutrient content based upon how it was produced, what types of liquids you fed it. You could adjust all that perfectly. And then further along that same idea, along with adjusting it per nutritional profiles, you could adjust it per culinary profiles. So you could have different types of, of cow cells that were blended. Or you could have even just cells that were meat and some that were lipids, so you have the right mixture of that. It could be just perfectly done. And further along those lines still, now we have this idea of microbreweries. And it's not uncommon for a gourmet restaurant to have their own brewery and make their own varietals of microbrewed beer. You could see the same thing for protein production. Places could have their own, you know, varietal that's distinct and, and patented and chosen for them. So other benefits are going to be environmental. We think about the relative greenhouse gases given off by the industry for raising animal foods. And arguments say that it's as high as a third or even 40 percent. And we don't see people giving up these foods anytime soon. Uh, deforestation, you know, water requirements, this is huge too. And then we think about just the safety factors. So infectious disease, you know, preventable accidental human death, 
a large amount of that does come back to food poisoning. And food poisoning, to be graphic, comes down to pretty much one thing, and that's the fact that our food gets contaminated by animal feces. So in, in the slaughter, in the processing of animals, feces get mixed in, no way around that. Like the saying is, what should happen? It's the same idea in terms of our food supply. And that's also why we get contamination from our plant foods. You know, when spinach has 057E coli that's fatal, that wasn't innately from the spinach, that was from the fertilizer. So if our protein could be grown without feces, without ever having contact with feces, this would be a non-issue. Clean meat wouldn't be something that you need to treat like radioactive waste in your kitchen. And I'm not vegan. I do use poultry, I do use meat, and I'm aware that you've got to be highly cautious of it when you're cooking. You can't use the same cutting board for you know, chicken breast and then go cut your salad on that. That's just asking for salmonella. But with clean meat, that could be a non-issue. Along these same lines, drug-resistant bacteria, so a huge bane for humans. And we see horror stories about people who lose their life in the best hospitals, and not for lack of treatment or medications, but just because nothing works anymore in some of these bacteria. Do you know that 80% of the bacteria that become drug-resistant, I'm sorry, 80% of the bacteria that are antibiotics that are made, 80% of the antibiotics that are made are made for the agricultural industry. They're fed to animals, so they grow more quickly and are less apt to get infections themselves. And then, in turn, that gives more time and more exposure from bacteria to these antibiotics. They get more of an opportunity to become resistant. So with clean meat, that could be also just a non-issue. It's grown clean, it's not contaminated to begin with. There'd be no need for antibiotics. And our rate of drug resistance could plummet. So things that could be made already, well, ground meat is the easiest. Collagen is pretty simple. Collagen and gelatin, those have been done. Egg white, milk, leather, also things that are very simple and already done on a scale currently. Now just a matter of making them more cost effective. Uh, steaks, you know, complex proteins, that'll be a next step, but that's not intangible. But the others, even fish, pretty simple. They're pretty simple structures. So I think the main reason I'm here talking to you about this because this is not something you can go out and buy today. This is not something that anyone's selling, that I'm selling. I think it could just completely change our society in such big ways. I think that in a decade or two, we could look back and just be shocked that over a billion cows or a billion chickens were raised in the world when we had only like 20,000 lions. The biggest bulk of the biomass on our planet right now are cows and chickens that are made for agricultural purposes. And if that can be a non-issue, I think that'd be one of the biggest revolutions of humanity for so many reasons. And I'm telling you this story because my fear is that health experts like myself or my friends could have misguided fears and they could derail this and set it back for decades or even longer. So some things I want to be very explicit about and make clear. This is not genetically modified organisms. This is not. There's no fear about playing God or tinkering with genes or making hybrid chimeras of animals and humans. None of those things apply. This is talking about using the exact same stuff, if you're not a vegan, the exact same stuff you eat right now and just growing it without an animal. The same cells, the same genes. If you were looking at ground meat grown in a laboratory under clean meat conditions and then purified, isolated ground meat from a cow, microscopically there's no difference. This is not frankenfood. This is not something scary. This is not something new or different. This is the same food that we're already eating, but it's that same food being made without any suffering, without any significant environmental impact, and also without any significant pollution. So current estimates are saying that within a couple of years, we'll see these products widely available. Estimates are by 2020, you could go to a grocery store and you could find a clean meat burger, more expensive, probably seven to ten dollars for the burger, rather than two, three, four dollars for a conventionally grown burger. There will be some that will be appealed that will that'll appeal strong enough to them where they'll, they'll want to make that change. But the estimate is that within seven years, so at time of this video, by 2025 is the current estimate. By 2025, these things can be price competitive. So you could walk into a supermarket and 
the average Joe, or however you want to say that, the average person can go say, I want to buy some, some ground meat. I'm going to make burgers, sloppy joes. I'm going to make some, some lasagna, whatever else people would typically make there. And here they've got a pack of lean ground meat and make some numbers up. That's $6.99 a pound. This came from a cow. This came from a feedlot. Over here is a package of lean ground meat. This is four ninety nine a pound. This came from cellular agriculture. There was no cows. It's the same stuff. At this point, the consumer knows they've tried it before. They actually like the taste a little better, or there's no difference. Better is completely plausible, but there's no reason in the world to think it would taste bad, because it's the same stuff. So they know they like it just fine, and it's $2 less a pound. Honestly, that's going to be the main differentiator right there for the bulk of humanity. If they can have this cheaper and it's just as good, awesome. For a lot of us, we're going to get excited about all the rest of that, the environmental impacts, the lower antibiotic yields, the less requirements for water, the lower amounts of deforestation, the humanitarian impacts. I'm excited about all of those things as well. So that's, that's my dream, and many are seeing this, and many are working hard to make that happen. So let's just know about this in advance and not be frightened of that. And if you do hear talk that's fear-based, that's saying, oh, this is playing with God, playing with nature in bad ways, this is GMO, this is Frankenfood, just know that those fears, it's always valid to be cautious about new steps, but those fears are frankly unfounded. This is the same meat that we eat already, and I can't wait till we can all have access to that. Dr. C here, take great care. We'll talk in really soon. Bye-bye.